minute. Sure. Sounds great. Let's see. Where's the right link? I think so. Close that guy. This should be a better chat. <clears throat> Let's see if we have participants. Okay, we have a reasonable number. You ready to get started? Yep, sounds great. All right. So let's um, get the afternoon session um, started back up. My name is Michael Mahoney. I'm at um, Berkeley and I've done work in a range of problems in machine learning and scientific areas, including um, physics and, and sort of physics informed sort of machine learning type models. And so I'm one of the co-organizers. And so um, thanks to the other co-organizers for basically organizing and putting together a great session. I mean, I hope everyone's enjoying it as much as I am. So we have an afternoon, um, the session, the structure is a little like the morning, we have an hour long presentation and then some breakout sessions and so on. And so for the hour long presentation keynote here, we're very happy to have Ben uh, Adcock from Simon Fraser. So Ben's uh, assistant professor in the mathematics department and he's received a range of awards, early career awards, Sloan fellowships, Fox prize, um, and a wide range of articles in venues, SIAM Review, PNAS, Foundations of Computational Math. So really nice mix of sort of applied math, some implementations and applications. His research interests, as, as that sort of indicates, include numerical analysis, mathematics of data, machine learning, approximation theory, harmonic analysis, and sort of a range of related areas. And so um, today he'll be telling us about uh, deep learning and, and scientific um, uh, scientific computing and um, closing the uh, theory practice gap. So Ben, it's all yours. Great. Uh, well, thank you for the introduction uh, and thank you to the, the organizers for the invitation here. Uh, I certainly enjoyed the, the morning session so far and I'm looking forward to, to a couple more very interesting days of talks. Uh, should also say it's very nice as well to have a conference that's on West Coast time for once. Uh, it avoided getting up early in the morning, so that was nice. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about today is, is really quite a sort of broad spectrum of, of research sort of combining sort of two main areas that I work in. Uh, and this is sort of combines joint work with a, a bunch of other people. Um, so a big part of it is done by, by my group uh, at SFU, uh, in particular my postdoc Nick Dexter, who you heard this morning, uh, my PhD students Juan Cardenas and Sebastian Moraga, uh, and my master's student Max Mira Nesterenko. But then a lot of it is also done with our collaborations uh, with uh, my former postdoc, Simone Brugia Paglia at Concordia, uh, and then a, a team at University of Cambridge led by Anders Hansen, who I've collaborated with for over a decade now, uh, and also Vegard Anton, who's at uh, University of Oslo. So let's, uh, let's get started. So we, we know that deep learning, or machine learning, but in particular, deep learning is being actively applied to many different scientific computing problems in the last uh, three to five years. So we've already seen talks this morning about uh, solving PDEs using deep learning techniques. Uh, we've seen and we will see talks about discovering dynamics uh, of dynamical systems. So Nathan Kutz will be giving a talk, a plenary talk about that uh, uh, later, later in the conference. Um, then there are also applications in surrogate model construction in UQ, which we've seen, and also inverse problems, including inverse problems in imaging, which is one of the topics I'll talk about. And there are many more applications, so, but suffice to say, this is now a very active area of inquiry. So sort of one of the questions one can ask is sort of why, why this sort of level of interest? Why uh, are, we, are we doing this? And of course, there's the, the answer, which is, well, 
machine uh, deep learning has proved very very successful at machine learning tasks why not try and apply it to uh, scientific computing problems uh, but another answer that one often sees especially sort of in uh, in uh, more um, numerical analysis and scientific computing talks is the the theory of existence of dnns uh, so there's now a rich and developing theory that tells us that DNNs are extremely expressible. Uh, so they're capable of approximating functions from a wide variety of classes, um, ranging from functions in Sobolev spaces to analytic functions, we'll see more of that later, to piecewise smooth functions, band-limited functions, uh, functions in barren spaces, cartoon-like functions, et cetera, et cetera. So this literature, of course, it, it has its origins with the universal approximation theorem, but it's really taken off in the last uh, five to 10 years. And now there's just a, a large volume of these expressibility results for, for deep neural network approximation. And in some sense, this gives credence for what, uh, what we're trying to do in scientific computing, because these are function spaces that we, that, uh, we sort of know and love and are, and are uh, very familiar to us from, from applications. So the, uh, the caveat to that, though, is that these results are existence results. They, uh, they typically say very little, little about the practical performance of trained deep neural networks on specific problems, uh, in particular in terms of really the pillars of numerical analysis, which are, well, arguably stability, accuracy, sample complexity, and computational cost. Okay. So, um, and Actually, what we'll, as we'll see later in the talk, uh, current methods based on deep learning may struggle to meet all of these criteria, okay? or may, may fail uh, quite badly in some of them, or uh, say in terms of accuracy, have behavior or, or behavior that's hard to interpret and hard to understand. So the sort of general question that, that I'm sort of interested in, uh, in a very broad sense, and, and that we'll try and talk about a little bit in this talk is, uh, how effective is deep learning as a tool for scientific computing problems? Uh, and in particular, are there algorithms for training deep neural networks that provably match or outperform state-of-the-art techniques? So I'm interested in, in uh, algorithms that come with theoretical guarantees. So I'm, I'm interested in improving theorems about uh, deep training of deep neural networks that can say something about how, how well you do. Uh, and in particular, how you perform against current uh, best-in-class schemes. So that's going to be a key key theme of the talk. Okay, so um, to summarize sort of what I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of the hour, this talk is really going to be in two parts. Um, these two parts are two completely different problems, um, but we have similar underlying themes throughout them. So um, the first part of the talk is going to be about using deep learning for high dimensional function approximation. So this is motivated by problems such as surrogate model construction and uncertainty quantification uh, and solving parametric PDEs and things like that. Uh, and the second uh, area of the talk is going to be deep learning for inverse problems, in particular inverse problems in imaging, such as medical, scientific uh, and industrial imaging modalities. So both uh, parts of the talk are going to have sort of two components. So the first one is an empirical component, um, which will illustrate some of the ways in which things, uh, practical performance can be rather uh, mysterious. And then the, the second part is going to be a theoretical component that's going to try and address this uh, general question that I posed a couple of slides ago. So in the first part of the talk, um, what we're going to see is that, uh, well, there's going to be there is very strong existence theory in for this type of problem, um, but trained DNNs can perform quite ex unexpectedly on smooth function approximation problems. However, the positive side is that there is, there does exist a way of doing training that's guaranteed to perform as well as state-of-the-art uh, polynomial based methods. For the second half of the talk, uh, so what we're gonna see in this is that deep learning methods for inverse problems are quite susceptible to instability. Uh, and also, uh, as a uh, in a sort of related sense, they they suffer from quite unpredictable generalization properties. Uh, however, uh, so that will be the empirical side, and then the on the theoretical side, I'll show that uh, actually for for suitable problem classes, you can actually 
uh, there are efficient DNNs that match the performance of state-of-the-art uh, sparse regularization procedures. Okay, so um, let me uh, dive into the first part of the talk. Uh, so this is deep learning for high dimensional function approximation. So here's the problem that we're interested in. So uh, quite simply stated, so we have a, a unit cube in D dimensions, uh, U, just for simplicity, I'll, I'll assume the unit cube. Uh, we have V is a Hilbert space, which will be our codomain. And then we have an unknown function f that maps between u and v. And we have m sample values of f. Uh, typically, we can choose where we want to sample. But at the end of the day, we get sample values. Uh, and our goal is to approximate f. So this problem, uh, so this was already discussed this morning in, uh, in Nick Dexter's talk uh, in some more detail. Um, but just to sort of reiterate uh, some of the main sort of features of this problem. So this problem is motivated by surrogate model construction in UQ. So here, for instance, F could be the, the solution map of a parametric PDE or a stochastic PDE uh, where uh, the variable Y, these are the parameters of the model. So, um, so it could be the, the whole solution of the, the parametric PDE, or it could be some scalar quantity of interest, say it's, it's, um, it's mean over the physical variables or something like that. Okay. But we're just gonna think of it as a function approximation problem. Okay. So what makes this problem challenging? Well, uh, as, as sort of has already been discussed, uh, first of all, the dimension is often large. Uh, if you have a complex model of a physical process, you typically have lots of parameters. So in, in the order of hundreds or maybe more. Um, so of course we, we run into issues with cursive dimensionality with using classical techniques. Uh, the second challenge is computing samples is expensive. Uh, so in say a setting of, of, a, um, of a surrogate model construction, every time you want to sample F, you typically, you might have an expensive numerical simulation that you have to run. So you're quite limited in the, in the amount of data that you can get. Thirdly, uh, another challenge here as well, um, one that I, I perhaps won't talk very much about, um, but the, the outputs of the codomain might be function space values. So there are in settings where F might be some scalar quantity of interest, um, but there are also settings where you might want to recover, say the whole solution map of a parametric PDE. Um, so that might be something that you want to deal with as well. Okay, so um, what's the general idea of learning? Well, the general idea of learning is to set this up as a training problem. So we have pairs uh, consisting of points yi and uh, function valuations f of yi. And then we try and learn a deep neural network approximation um, to f. Okay, so uh, as, um, as Nick was discussing this morning, so uh, a couple of years ago, actually, when, when Nick joined uh, my group, um, we set to work trying to understand how well deep neural networks uh, perform as function approximators for uh, the types of function approximation problems that we, that we have uh, in, in scientific computing applications. So, um, so we have this framework um, called MLFA. Um, here's the GitHub link. And this is a framework for investigating the practical performance of deep learning on, on typically scalar valued function approximation. Um, and it's sort of allowing us to dig into questions such as architecture design, uh, how to train, how to optimize, uh, and also allowing for comparisons with uh, state of the art polynomial approximation methods based on, on compressed sensing, at least for, for smooth function approximation. And so Nick talked about this more this morning, but I, I wanted to sort of re-emphasize a couple of results. So um, the, the basic, uh, the, the, the sort of key fact is if you set up a standard DNN architecture, so a, say a ReLU architecture, there are various ReLU architectures here, um, fully connected, um, with different, say, different types of uh, widths and, and depths, uh, and you train it. Uh, so we train typically using Adam, but we, in the in the paper, we compare various other trainings and things like that, uh, and various different initialization strategies and, and such like. The simple fact is, you typically struggle to do well. 
Um, so your deep neural network approximation, here's a simple smooth function in, I think it's eight dimensions. Uh, your DNN approximations achieve sort of errors between two and three digits of accuracy as a function of the number of samples uh, that you have. Um, whereas other methods, for instance, uh, polynomial based methods can achieve much, much smaller errors. And this is in spite of the fact, as we'll, we'll see in a minute, that there exist DNNs that can, that, that can get an error down here. Okay, so there exist DNNs that can do much better. Um, however, with sort of standard architectures and standard training, we struggle to, to get high accuracy. Um, on the other hand, if you take a more complicated function, uh, still, still very smooth, but uh, um, uh, more, uh, more challenging to approximate, then you start to see that DNNs can offer, uh, or these standard DNNs with standard training and standard architectures can start to offer competitive performance against, uh, against best in class schemes. Uh, and, and so one of the things that we, we, we do in this framework is you can play around with uh, this parameter beta, which, which determines the depth versus the width and, and try and optimize that as well. And um, generally we have some sort of guidance for how you might do that in practice. Um, so that's sort of smooth function approximation problem. And then, um, so when, uh, when we started doing this, um, uh, we, were, we were quite disappointed with the results that we were getting. And so then our sort of natural thought was to think, well, let's try a non-smooth function. Okay, so we know, of course, classification functions are, are non-smooth functions. Uh, so maybe we ought to, ought to try that. And of course, non-smooth functions happen, uh, occur, all across scientific computing, including in surrogate model construction or more generally functions with uh, sharp interfaces and things like that. So we thought we'd try simil uh, doing similar tests with uh, just a simple, this is a, what we call just a half space indicator function. And so what we see here interestingly is, okay, so polynomial best methods don't converge here uh, as you, completely as you would expect. Um, but the, um, the DNN, uh, so the, the DNNs that we train really struggle to get, uh, to get any kind of high accuracy. They do suffer quite badly from the curse of dimensionality and you also see this, this double descent behavior as well. But nevertheless, I mean, it, I think it says something that we're using the same, uh, same scheme, we're using the same type of deep neural networks for both the smooth and non-smooth function approximation problems and we can get something in both cases. Whereas of course, polynomial based methods are very much tied to the smoothness. Okay, so the takeaway from this, uh, this sort of, um, and the, sorry, I should say there's a lot more results in the paper uh, and also in the, the supplementary materials to the paper, but the sort of takeaways is that we often have these sort of strong existence results for uh, deep neural network approximation, but if you try and train sort of standard DNN architectures, um, uh, they, they struggle to perform well. Um, uh, across a variety of settings. Okay, so that's the that's the sort of empirical part of, of, of this first part of the talk. Uh, now I want to just discuss uh, the theoretical side in a little bit more detail. So um, in order to discuss this, we sort of need to fix a class of functions. Uh, and in uh, the sort of parametric uh, DE literature, uh, it's common to think about functions that are holomorphic. Um, so this comes from the, the fact that there's a lot of theory now that says that uh, many different classes of parametric differential equations um, uh, have solution maps that are holomorphic functions of their variables. So this can lead us to defining a, a formal class of problems. So we can consider a class of functions uh, that are holomorphic in a, in a Bernstein polyellipse E row. So Bernstein poly ellipse is just a tensor product of one dimensional Bernstein ellipses. Uh, and it's defined by a vector of parameters rho here, um, where each component is just a, a, a scalar, which is just the, the, the corresponding parameter of the Bernstein ellipse. So that's our problem class. And then just for convenience, we, we also normalize the functions to one, uh, just to make the, uh, the results a little cleaner to state. So the, um, there are sort of two, two sort of factors here. So first of all, uh, in practice, we, we often expect that these rho j's are gonna differ quite, uh, or can potentially differ in scale, okay? So uh, they're not all equal uh, and some, some can be larger 
uh, than the others. And really what this is saying is that F might be smoother in some coordinate directions than in other coordinate directions. Um, furthermore, we generally uh, a priori don't know that behavior in advance. So we don't know what this row is in advance in particular. Um, this is not atypical at all. We have some, think of F as some black box that's uh, evaluating some, uh, some complex uh, PDE model, okay, we, we might have some, have some result about smoothness, but we can't just probe, just by probing the black box, we generally can't uh, figure out what this row is uh, a priori. So this is not, uh, this is not anything new. This idea of, of anisotropy, of course, is, a, is an old one in high dimensional approximation. Uh, and in the sort of last 10 to 15 years, people have tried to think about anisotropy as sort of low dimensional structure. Uh, and this led, as, as Nick uh, discussed in his talk, to, to a lot of work on using polynomial approximations with compressed sensing to, uh, to approximate smooth functions in this kind of way. Um, and this allows you to tackle the case of this hidden anisotropic behavior uh, using these sort of, you can sort of reinterpret this as the kind of compressed sensing idea of having a sparse vector, but where you don't know where the, where the support is. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about DNN. So first of all, a DNN existence theorem. Uh, so now that we've defined our class of holomorphic functions, uh, so you can prove that there's a DNN that achieves an exponential rate of convergence over this class. So this is a result uh, from a couple of years ago of Opshaw, Schwab, and Zek. And what they showed is that uh, there's, for every S, there's a ReLU DNN uh, so they considered only the scalar case, but actually it's not too challenging to extend it to the, uh, to the Hilbert value case as well. Uh, and what they showed is that there's a ReLU DNN that can achieve an error that scales like uh, the exponential of negative gamma to the, times S to the one over D. So here gamma is a constant, um, depending on D, some parameter epsilon and rho, uh, and S is, um, uh, you can think about this as, as roughly equivalent to the number of parameters in your, in your deep neural network. So I didn't write down the architecture here, but it scales in a mild way with, with S. So, um, okay, so I, I, should, I should point out one more thing here as well. So this gamma that you see, uh, it depends on the row J's, but it depends on their product. Okay, so the, it's invariant to say the ordering of them. So it, it sort of allows you to think about problems where you, you don't know the ordering of which of your variables are most important. Okay, so the conclusion, the takeaway from this is that you can, you can, that, uh, you can prove that there exist deep neural networks uh, and these don't need to be too deep or too wide. Um, how uh, you can prove that these, these neural networks exist and they approximate a holomorphic function with exponential accuracy. How is this result proved? Well, it's sort of typical of existence theory results um, in the literature. Uh, the first thing you do is you prove that there's a polynomial that achieves this kind of accuracy. Uh, and then you prove that you can approximate a, a po any polynomial with, with deep neural networks of given size. Okay, so, that's, uh, so this is using these ideas from, uh, from Yurotsky and, and various others, in, uh, if you're familiar with this literature. Okay, so um, this says that there exists a DNN. Uh, and so what we were interested in showing is that there is uh, what we call a practical existence theorem to show that there not only exists such a DNN, but there's also a way in which you can train such a DNN from, uh, from data. Okay. So here's the theorem that we, uh, that we proved. Uh, and so it's uh, in, in this paper here, which is on the archive. Uh, and I think I will not uh, read out all the technical details here, but this is the, uh, the main idea of the theorem. So it says, suppose that I draw M points, um, IID from the uniform measure on, on U. So that's a pretty standard way of sampling. Um, it's just Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, then it says the following. So first of all, there's a class N of ReLU DNNs of a given size width, a number of trainable parameters, uh, scaling mildly with, uh, with uh, D uh, M tilde, which is equal to M up to a log factor and this gamma. There's a regularization function J. 
and there's a choice of regularization parameter. Interestingly, the choice is actually interest, uh, independent of the function you're trying to approximate, which is kind of a nice thing. Um, such that with high probability, uh, there's a, if you solve the corresponding DNN training problem, uh, then you get a DNN that approximates your function to exponential accuracy in the number of sample points. Okay, so it's exponential in, uh, in M tilde, which is, think of that as just, just M uh, divided by a polylogarithmic factor. So what we're saying is there exists a provably good way to do DNN training. Uh, you get exponential accuracy, you get a, so you get a, an approximation error bound, you get a bound on the sample complexity as well, because you have this in terms of M tilde. Uh, and it's also stable in the sense that if you have noisy data, um, so you, your samples are perturbed by an amount Ni, then the error in the final approximation is perturbed by the, the maximum as well. Okay, so you can also, so this, this holds in the scalar case, you can also extend this to the Hilbert value case as well. So um, the way in which you do that is you obviously you have to do some kind of discretization of your Hilbert space. So think of this as typically, if you're working in parametric uh, PDEs, think of this as a finite element discretization, for instance. Uh, and then what you do is you train, you can think of DNNs as, uh, as mappings from your input space to the, the coefficient space with respect to this basis. Uh, so they're mappings from RD to RK, where K is the number of basis functions. Then you can prove a, 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 a theorem that's essentially identical. Uh, so you get the same two error bounds, so the approximation error here, the noise error uh, here, and then you get an additional term that's the, uh, the, disc, the physical discretization error. So it's the proportional to the, to the uh, best approximation error in this space, okay, so which is of course what you hope it would be um, in that sense. Okay, so to, to conclude this sort of first part of the, the talk, um, so what we're saying is that uh, there, there provably exist good ways of training deep neural networks. So these provably achieve exponential rates of convergence with mild sample complexity. Furthermore, we get the same rates that uh, uh, one can prove for best-in-class schemes based on compressed sensing with polynomial approximation. Okay, so this all sounds good. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a large caveat here. Uh, how do we prove this theorem? Well, effectively we cheat. What do we do? We take uh, compressed sensing um, based polynomial approximations and we, we re recode that as a deep neural network training problem. So I should say that we cheat. Um, it's it, it's not. I, I should emphasize that this is not straightforward to do. It's it's. Uh, there are a lot of technical details involved in getting this right and getting this to work uh, and getting the the, uh, the theoretical statement that we have. But the point is is that all we're really saying here is that you there's a way of training a deep neural network that can do almost as well as a polynomial based approximation. So we don't intend this to be something that you would do in practice. Uh, we, we think of this as a, as a result saying that you can, there are provably good ways of doing this. Okay. So that's, that's the caveat, but I should point out that this is what this is saying is this is highlighting the potential uh, and that uh, if you're in Nick's talk this morning, you would have seen some initial results that actually on, on parametric PDE problems, if we set up the, the architecture and the training correctly, we can actually get uh, competitive performance with deep neural networks. So this theorem is saying that this can feasibly be done. So uh, the question is how much better that can we do in the future? Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the end of the first part of the talk. Uh, I don't know if anyone had any questions about that. Um, if not, I will move on to the second part, which will be sort of uh, completely, completely different. I don't see any questions in the chat. If anyone has a question, maybe interrupt um, and speak up or put it in the chat quickly. And of course, if you get a question that comes to you or if we start too quickly um, before you get everything typed in, we can revisit it. Um, yeah, sure. I, after Ben finishes up the talk. So I don't see anything coming up on the chat then. So why don't you continue? And if there's questions, either about the previous stuff or what, he's, what Ben's gonna talk about next, just post it in the chat. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. 
um, I, I just I was just curious why uh, all these uh, theorems uh, have been using a ReLU function as an activation function. Um, does does that function afford some special properties that help the proofs? Um, yeah. So so great question. Uh, so it, uh, so the I guess some of this is so it, it goes back to these original papers of Yurotsky from a few years ago that were based on ReLUs. Um, so it does make the proofs. It, it, well, the, the proofs go through with ReLUs. Um, I'm not sure what other types of uh, uh, activation functions that uh, you could prove this for. So I know there's there's work that uses sort of these rectified polynomial units, which can actually make things even simpler. But that's a that's a perhaps. Um, taking it a little further away from what people do in practice. Uh, I'm not aware of results that use, say, hyperbolic tangent or something like that, um, that would be of this flavor, so. Thank you. Okay, um, unless there's any other question. Uh, okay, let me, let me move on to the, the second part of the talk. Okay, so in the second part of the talk, I want to uh, uh, switch directions and talk about inverse problems. Uh, so let me uh, first of all state the sort of gem very general form of the inverse problem. So uh, let's suppose X and Y are Banach spaces. Uh, A is some mapping between X and Y. And we are given noisy measurements of an unknown element X. Uh, in our Banach space, capital X. So these measurements are of the form U equals AX plus E, E is the noise here. Okay, so, uh, so our goal is to recover X from, from the noisy measurements that we see. Um, throughout the, what I'm gonna say next, we're, we're just gonna think about the uh, simple discrete linear inverse problem where here X is uh, CN, Y is CM, and A then is just equivalent to an M by N matrix. Um, and we're probably even gonna specialize this a little bit further and just think about uh, the case where A is a subsample Fourier or radon transform. Okay, so this is a very standard inverse problem uh, in imaging. So subsample Fourier measurements come up in, in applications such as MRI, um, but also various others. And of course, subsampled radon measurements come up in any Kind of tomographic imaging modality such as x-ray CT, or various other forms of CT as well. Okay, so the um, what makes this problem difficult? Uh, well, the, there are various things that can make this problem difficult. The thing that I'm going to focus on is the fact that the, the number of samples that you have in this problem is often highly limited. So uh, your uh, the M here, which is the number of samples, is typically much smaller in the in this discrete case than the uh, n which is the size of your image okay so um uh so i'm i'm i yeah okay so uh the so this is the, the so sorry i should say something a little bit more on the on the main challenge so uh if you uh, if, if, for instance, you take the problem uh, MRI, so you're dealing with subsample Fourier measurements. So, the number of samples that you you have, the M is is roughly speaking proportional to the scan time. Uh, so, uh, one of the key goals in MRI or MRI research is to reduce the scan time whilst retraining the quality of the of the images that you reconstruct. Similarly, in in something like X-ray CT, the number of samples is loosely proportional to the radiation dose. So if you can reduce the number of samples that you need to get a high quality reconstruction, uh, you can reduce the radiation dose that you expose the patient to. Um, therefore, you could, for instance, scan them more frequently while they're undergoing some course of treatment. So this is, this is sort of a, a sort of key challenge in, in imaging is, is getting away with fewer measurements in practice. Okay, so um, what's, the sort of uh, the sort of current 
broadly speaking, state of the art way of, of solving these types of problems in definitely in an imaging context. What people have been doing for the last sort of 10 years is using techniques based on sparse regularization. So the general idea is to fit an image uh, X hat that uh, minimizes a, a fidelity term to your data. Uh, so some uh, loss function, typically the two norm between your, uh, uh, your measurements U uh, and the forward map applied to, um, applied to the image, plus a regularization term. So lambda times J of Z. Um, and so typically in the past, J has been some kind of handcrafted regularization term. So handcrafted is a term that people have started using in the last few years. And, and what is typically meant by this is that this is designed purposely to exploit some explicit structural property in images. So for instance, it could be a discrete gradient operator with the L1 norm. So that would lead to a TV type minimization problem where you're, you're trying to uh, exploit sparsity of the gradient of the image, or it could be an L1 norm with a, with a wavelet transform. So then you're trying to exploit sparsity of images in the wavelet domain. And of course, there, there are many variations on, on these kind of themes. And the point is, is that this is generally something that's designed in advance based on kind of what you know about the problem. Okay, so why has this sort of um, uh, become a popular thing to do? Well, one of the arguments is that uh, you, you actually have some, you have, well, firstly it works, and secondly, you have good theoretical grounding for this. Uh, so the theory of compressed sensing uh, can be used to provide sort of guarantees on stability and accuracy of the reconstruction X hat, subject to uh, suitable conditions on your, your forwards operator A. Okay, some of which I'll discuss a little bit later. Okay, so this is, so sparse regularization has been around since, well, uh, for uh, 10 or 15 years now. Um, what's happened in the last three to five years is people have started to very actively use deep learning uh, to solve inverse problems, uh, in particular inverse problems in imaging. So what's the general idea? The general idea is to uh, take training data. So training, your training data now are pairs consisting of measurements UI uh, and ground truth images XI. So these could be um, a database of brain images in the context of MRI or something like that. Uh, and you have access to, to their measurements or maybe you simulate their measurements as well uh, instead. So. Um, so the idea is you have a bunch of training data and now you're gonna try and learn an approximate inverse mapping that takes you from the measurement space to the image space. So um, there's lots of work going on about how to do this uh, in, in the inverse problems community in particular with applications in imaging. And there are many different ways in which people are trying to do this. So uh, including things like fully trained models, image domain learning, uh, sensor domain learning, unraveled optimization schemes, learn proximal max, plug and play methods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's just there's uh, the, just a huge sort of um, dichotomy of different approaches out there at the moment. So of course this is a conference about incorporating uh, incorporating physics and machine learning. Uh, so uh, I. I, there wasn't very much about physics in the first part of the talk. There'll be a little bit more in the second part of the talk. Um, one of the things, one of the themes that we'll, we'll discuss uh, a little bit in the, in the later slides is um, how, how one does this in the context of inverse problems. So here, what we, what's often meant by physics is the, the model of the forwards operator A. Um, so many of these learning approaches use uh, a model of the forward operator um, to uh, in in the uh, uh, in the reconstruction um, and in the learning. Uh, however, there are also some methods that try and circumvent essentially all physical knowledge whatsoever. So these fully trained or learn the physics models try and actually just learn the forwards operator from data. Uh, and of course, there are hybrid effort, uh, approaches that try and try and do uh, something in the middle. One of the reasons in which you might want to try and do that is that uh, often in, in practice, in, in imaging problems, you don't have precise knowledge of your forwards operator um, and or, or there are trade-offs between having a simple model for the forwards operator, maybe it's a linear model 
um, but uh, it's it's not as accurate as a as a more sophisticated model, which is maybe nonlinear. Okay, so this comes up in MRI, it comes up in CT. So in particular in CT, um, uh, the if you the the sort of artifacts that come from modeling the nonlinear forwards operator as a linear forwards operator as a radon transform, uh, it, it gives rise to these artifacts known as beam hardening, for instance. So there's often a trade-off uh, and how best to sort of balance those trade-offs is a tricky thing. Um, and this is one of the things in which learning is trying to do as well, is to, uh, trying to, to use learning to help uh, deal with inaccurate forwards operators. Okay, so that was a little bit of a tangent, but uh, to sort of bring things back to the sort of central idea, um, let me stress that sort of deep learning for inverse problems is, is something that's causing a big stir. Uh, so I think it's certainly in imaging, this is now the sort of, the, the, the really the central theme of, of, of a lot of the research that's going on is how to use learning techniques to, uh, to solve image reconstruction problems. Um, so, we sort of started thinking about this a few years ago uh, and the sort of question that we uh, uh, we started asking each other is well should we should we be concerned about this um, uh, is is the future going to be sort of uh, learning based approaches for for solving uh, imaging problems and we we ended up writing a paper that was published in PNAS uh, last year and um, we also have our article in Science News that uh, came out uh, uh, earlier this month, and what we what we raise in these papers is the uh, the issue that uh, deep learning based approaches for inverse problems have a tendency to be unstable. So that's the sort of first issue, and then the second issue, which is uh, also related, is that they they generalize in in or they can generalize in quite unpredictable ways. So uh, what I want to show first is sort of some, exper uh, uh, some experiments from these papers illustrating these, uh, these features. So let me start with, uh, with instability. So here's a typical example. So this is, um, this is what's called the automap network. Uh, uh, which can be used to solve a variety of different problems, but uh, we're, we're going to consider it in the setting of MRI. Uh, so this was published in Nature in 2018. And so what we did in our, in our paper is to examine instability, we, uh, we created uh, essentially perturbations that aim to uh, simulate uh, worst case instabilities. So we took an image X uh, and then we perturbed it uh, in a small way uh, with one of these perturbations in such a way that when we took the measurements of X plus the, the perturbation and then tried to reconstruct it, the, the neural network reconstruction map would, uh, would give us very large artifacts. So here's, a, here's an illustration. So here's a typical brain image. Uh, here are three of these perturbations and they go from increasing magnitude from B1 up to B3 here. So hopefully you can see that, well, you, hopefully you can't see very much difference between V1, X plus V1 and the original image X here. Um, but then as you get to X plus V3, you, you'll probably notice some, some artifacts around here as well uh, because it's larger in magnitude. So then what we do is we take these perturbations, uh, we, we take measurements of them. So we take the measurements A of X plus VI, and then we run it through the, the trained neural network. Uh, and what you see here is you see very fairly dramatic artifacts uh, occurring in the reconstructed image. So just to let me toggle back and forth again, here's the, uh, here are the, uh, the images and the perturbations, and here's what you get when these are reconstructed. Okay, so certainly here, you're seeing very, very significant artifacts in the reconstruction. So what this is telling you is that this mapping N is, is unstable. Yeah. Uh, because um, small, small perturbations can have a very large effect on the output. So I should point out that we were sort of inspired to do this because of this literature on adversarial perturbations in deep learning and classification. Um, so there's this uh, line of work starting in, in 2013 or 2014 about 
uh, that's that's led to this discovery that sort of trained deep neural networks for problems like image classification that are unstable. So in an image classification problem, you can uh, apply a very small perturbation to an image of a of a cat, uh, run it through the network, and it gets incorrectly labeled as a dog, for instance. And so we're using similar ideas here, but in a, in a sense, it's a, it's a, it's actually a more interesting problem because the output of a, of an image reconstruction problem is an image; it's a continuous object rather than just a label. So various different types of artifacts can occur um, depending on the on the reconstruction map. We'll see a couple of more instances in a second. One thing I should point out, though, is I, I should point out that this is. Um, this is not something that we should be happy to live with. Um, so uh, one of the sort of surprising uh, bits of feedback we got on our papers was to sort of say, well, you know, this is just a problem with the inverse problem. This is a bad inverse problem. And anything that you're gonna, you're gonna do is, is gonna lead to um, these kind of instabilities. And the, it, this is just simply not correct. So uh, sparse regularization methods, um, for example, using wavelets are, stable for for many different types of inverse problems so here's an example with the same exactly the same calculations um, but using a sparse regularization method instead uh, so here are the perturbations so these are the worst case perturbations for a sparse regularization uh, reconstruction and here are the reconstructions so you see there's really no explosion in the uh, in the um, perturbation when you run it through the reconstruction map indicating that this is stable. Okay, here are a couple more examples, uh, just different types of networks. Um, here again, you can see these, these bad artifacts being created in these reconstructions. Okay, so another thing that we, we get asked, um, and that's another thing that's also uh, used to... Um, uh, um, so Ben, just a quick clarifying question. Sure. Do you use the perturbation in K-space? Uh, okay, good, good question. So we actually, um, we create the perturbation in image space, and then we, uh, we push it through the forwards operator. So that gives you a perturbation in, in K space. But we, we do the, the algorithm that we use in the paper creates a perturbation in image space, but you can create perturbations in K space as well. So there are some papers that do that. But in, in a sense, because we're trying to get, we, we, because we're trying to simulate worst case perturbations, it doesn't matter, at least from the purposes of this study. So. Uh, okay, so hopefully that, that answered that question. Um, so uh, yeah, so one of the questions that we get asked is uh, how rare are these instabilities or how rare are these perturbations that cause these, these bad artifacts? Uh, and of course, it depends on the on the neural network uh, that's been trained. Um, but there are certainly some neural networks out there um, that are very unstable that can be perturbed badly by even just random uh, mean zero Gaussian noise. So an example is uh, is uh, what's known as the deep MRI network. Uh, this typically performs very well; it achieves very high accuracy. But actually, if you throw Gaussian noise onto the measurements, um, and uh, I realize there's a typo here. Sorry, this is, I should uh, point out, this is, this in light of the previous question, this is Gaussian noise in the measurements. And so the V here is, is after we apply the pseudo inverse of A to get a perturbation in the image domain. Okay, so it is Gaussian noise in the measurements here. Um, but what you see here, so here's a crop of the original image is that with Gaussian noise, uh, so we did a comparison here where we sort of took the worst of 100 and the worst of 20 and that kind of thing. You can see sort of physical features that have uh, been sort of removed or altered. So here, there's sort of a continuous piece of tissue here, um, but actually with Gaussian noise, you actually end up with this, this gap here, which is uh, not, not so good. Okay, so that, that was the, the uh, instability issue. Um, and then the sort of second issue to this as well is that uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, deep learning approaches, the, the generalization behavior of the trained neural network can be quite unpredictable. Uh, 
So here is another example with this automap network. Uh, here are four images. Uh, X2, X3, and X4 are from the training and test set. Uh, and X1, what we did to X1 is we perturbed X2 in a small way. Uh, so it's, you, you cannot, or uh, you should not be able to see any difference between X1 and X2. Um, but what you see is that the reconstruction quality varies dramatically across these four images. Uh, so in particular from between X1 and X2, it jumps by nearly 300%, um, even though there's really no difference in these images to the, to, uh, in the eyeball metric. So again, this is another, another sort of undesirable feature in some ways. And again, it's not something that we, we should necessarily be happy about. Uh, so again, sparse regularization techniques typically generalize in, in quite predictable ways. Uh, so here you see that the error across these, all these four images uh, is, is very similar. Sorry, I should have said here, the second line here, this is the error map. Okay, so this is showing X hat minus X, um, pixel by pixel. Uh, so you see very similar reconstruction quality with these uh, uh, more classical methods. Okay, so, um, so that's the, the and, and, and Ben, we're yeah. just to keep track of time, we're at about T minus 10 minutes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so um, let me let me say a few things about theory. So um, we having sort of shown that these instabilities occur, and then we started to think about, well, what can be the mathematical mechanisms that might drive instabilities? Um, and one of these mechanisms that we identified was what we call overperformance. Um, so overperformance is, is really the following. So um, it's very easy uh, if you do learning to set up the following type of situation. So I suppose I have two images X and X primed um, that are not close, uh, so they're far apart. Um, but then when I map them with the forwards operator, uh, they end up having measurements that are similar. This can easily occur because uh, I'm generally in the setting of uh, underdetermined problems. So I have fewer measurements than, than pixels in a discrete imaging problem. So I always have a forwards operator with the null space. So this can always, this can always happen. Uh, uh, or this can easily happen. But if I do learning, then it's very easy to learn a neural network um, or some other kind of mapping that will take the measurements of uh, X to X and will take the measurements of X prime to X prime or close to them. As long as these, obviously these measurements are not identical, but you can always set up a training problem and drive your training error to zero. That's going to get you to basically interpolate. Um, as you might imagine though, this is going to cause your map to become unstable. Uh, and so we proved a theorem that, that said that this is exactly what's going to happen. So here's the theorem. Um, so it says the following, suppose I have uh, my, my forwards operator A, uh, I have a reconstruction map F from my measurement domain to my image domain. And suppose I have the following scenario. So I have X and X primed um, such that the X and X primed are not close. Uh, so they're at least two eta apart. Um, but their measurements are within the eta of each other. And furthermore, uh, both X and X prime are reconstructed well by, from their measurements by my uh, reconstruction map. Uh, then we have the following. So first of all, uh, we have instabilities. So the Lipschitz constant uh, around um, the measurements of X uh, scales like one over eta. So in other words, as I drive eta to zero, uh, so I try and reconstruct two things whose measurements are, are closer and I try and reconstruct them better, uh, I am necessarily gonna get instabilities. Furthermore, we can get false positives and false negatives. So the idea here is that um, you, can take, you, you can take your image X, uh, you can make a small perturbation of it and you can end up with the image X primed. Okay. Um, so this is sort of when we when we call these false positives and false negatives, we have in mind that we have a healthy brain X, we have a brain with a tumor in it X prime, 
Um, these are obviously close to each other and they differ only by the, the small tumor. And what we're saying is that we could have an algorithm that could give you, take a healthy brain and reconstruct a brain with a tumor. That would be a false positive. And then vice versa, we could have a reconstruction algorithm that could take an image of that has a tumor uh, and reconstruct a healthy brain giving a false negative. Um, okay, so just a couple of comments about these. So these are not strong conditions. Uh, these are these conditions, we can actually show that they hold for some of these networks. Um, so these are, these are not sort of, uh, th these are very weak conditions in general. Um, and I should also point out that this is not, this is not just an effect that we're the only ones that have seen. There's a, there's sort of an increasing awareness now in the last year or so of sort of AI generated hallucinations as they're often called in imaging. Uh, so if you uh, go and look at some of these, uh, these imaging challenges like the, the fast MRI challenge, you'll see these, these uh, hallucinations being mentioned in, in some of these works uh, and some of the works reporting on them as well. Okay, so um, just in the last couple of minutes, let me uh, just say a little bit more on the on the positive side, though. Um, so um, what this sort of previous work is saying is that there's a really there's a subtle trade off between accuracy and stability. Uh, that the previous theorem is saying is as you try and drive your push your accuracy higher, you can easily slip into this instability regime where you're trying to get something from nothing. Um, so then we started sort of asking questions along the line of, well, can we, can we actually compute uh, deep neural networks with guarantees on stability and accuracy for, for inverse problems? Um, and of course, in order to, to think about this, you've, you first need to sort of formalize a class of inverse problems that you, see, uh, that you want to solve. Uh, so what we did is we said, okay, let's, let's deal with a class that's well studied in the context of um, of inverse problems um, uh, with, because of its relations to uh, compressed sensing theory, because it allows uh, theoretical analysis through compressed sensing. So this is a class of uh, problems where, a class of discrete inverse problems where the forwards, mate, uh, forwards operator A has an RIP. Okay, so, okay, technically we need that A is not too large in norm, but let's consider a class of forward, a class of matrices um, that satisfy the RIP with some kind of bounds. Okay, so that's, um, that's our class of matrices. And then let's co consider a class or family of measurement vectors. So these are noisy measurements of, um, of images that are approximately sparse, basically. So I won't, I'll admit the, uh, the full description here, but what we're saying here is we're considering a, for each matrix A in our class, we're considering a family of measurement vectors that correspond to a sparse image plus noise, basically. Why consider this class? Well, we consider this class because we have a baseline. So we know that for this problem class, uh, for any matrix A and any uh, measurement vector uh, with corresponding underlying image X, we know that we can recover it uh, up to some error zeta. Um, where, Z, sorry, zeta is uh, defining our, our accuracy here, and our stability. So we know we have a baseline for recovering this class. So the question is, can we achieve the same kind of error with, with the deep neural network? I should point out here, this is a, this is a very simple problem. You can make this, uh, this mathematical formulation a lot, more, uh, a lot more intricate, a lot more detailed, and you can uh, make it more relevant to imaging by considering sort of sparsity and transformed domains as well. But just to, to keep it simple, I'm just presenting the, the sort of simplest version of the result here. Okay, so um, so here's the uh, here's the result to end on. So this says that uh, there is a there is a way of computing given a given a uh, an operator a forwards operator A, uh, which is an n by n matrix. There is a way of computing a neural network n. Uh, as a, as a reconstruction map that achieves this error zeta over all uh, measurement vectors in the class. Okay. Furthermore, okay, so showing that this exists is straightforward, of course, as an existence theorem is not very interesting, but the, what makes this more interesting is that this is actually a network that's, that's uh, rather efficient, okay? So it's not actually that deep. It's depth scales like log of the accuracy 
and its maximum width scales like the size of the input. Uh, so it scales like n plus m. This is particularly important uh, because one of, the, one of the arguments in imaging for using deep neural networks is that um, once they're trained, they could be much faster as reconstruction maps than sparse regularization, um, which is often quite slow because you have to solve an optimization problem. So this is giving credence to this, this kind of idea that you can achieve log, a depth of log of the accuracy. Okay, um, so just the final thing, I should point out that this is actually not this is not just a theoretical exercise. You can actually compute these networks and you can use them and, and try them and they actually perform, they perform well and reasonably well in practice. Um, so here's this unstable automap network. Here's this, this new network um, that uh, is stable. I should point out that uh, this, is, uh, this was done by my collaborators. So they have a paper on it very recently uh, where they, they actually set up and constructed these networks, which they termed Firenets. So, um, so here, these are the worst case perturbations for these network, and you can see that they're they're stable to the uh, to these perturbations. Okay, so um, let me end there. Uh, so uh, we know that deep learning for scientific computing has a lot of potential. Um, however, there are concerns about stability, generalization, and the gap between existence theory and practical performance. So what I've tried to highlight here is sort of what we've been doing for the last couple of years, which is to, on the one hand, understand the practical performance of deep learning and, and deep neural networks, but also establish essentially lower bounds, uh, showing that you can compute DNNs that match the performance of state-of-the-art techniques. So of course, what we're trying to do now is to use these theoretical insights to try and get better performance, um, but also not lose the robustness and reliability of the of, um, existing techniques. Okay, uh, let me end there and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, great, thanks a lot. Um, if there's questions, either um, I'd suggest post them in the chat or unmute yourself if you can and um, go ahead and ask them. And we have a break now before we get to the breakout session. So if you want to uh, um, step out of the room as it were and come back in a few minutes, that's okay. But if there's any questions, um, I'm sure Ben, you'll hang around during the during the break if people want to either post it in the uh, chat or uh, oh, yeah, yeah, even I'll, ask it. Yeah, I can hang around. So I had one, Ben. Actually, it, it looked like you the stability results looked like it was sort of formulated, you know, like a numerical analyst would, right? You 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 don't do this worst case analysis. It's more like you. But for arbit for a given problem, you know, you consider well posed problems, you know, and try and make inverse and the inverse problem well posed, and then you talk about the stability of an algorithm, sort of in terms of forward and backward error. Um, it looked how does that relate to uh, in your mind, either technically or not? Um, how would that relate to generalization, the way a machine learning person would formulate it? Because they're looking at sort of forward and error, backward error in an analogous way, but a little bit different because they hypothesized data and so on. Um, do you have a sense of that? Yeah, so, um, so, okay, so I should say, so, okay, in the context of inverse problems, I'm thinking of stability in terms of, um, do you have noise in your, in your measurements? Um, okay, so you're, you're saying, of course, this is related, and you can sort of relate it to generalization errors. So I, I think um, this, one of the the this sort of issue of unpredictable generalization is is uh, it sort of boils down in some sense to this image uh, this issue of like what is the what's a mathematical description of a of a class of images right um, that we don't have a good good description so uh, what we what we try and do in, in this result here, for instance, is say, okay, well, we're going to think of our class. We're going to take a class that we understand because we, we, we can prove something about it, which is say the class of images that are sparse or sparse in some transform and then show that we can, uh, we, we have a neural network that can achieve that kind of, um, so then we can define accuracy with respect to that class. So we can think of things that are approximately sparse and we can think of stability in terms of noise on the measurements. But of course, if you if you don't have a class of images, then it's it's hard to talk about generalization in some sense. 
if that uh, if that answers your your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's um, the the results presented in the stability analysis are only for MLP FFNN, right? Do you think that it is possible to arrive at similar results for other architectures? Uh, uh, sorry, which, um, which part of the talk are you referring to? Do you, uh, um, do you mean the first part of the talk or the second part or both? Uh, first. Uh, okay. So, uh, yes. So, okay. So in the first part of the talk, um, the, uh, as I mentioned, the way in which we do this, right, is we, uh, approximate a polynomial with a neural network. Um, so the, what one would need to do, uh, is to, is to show or that one could approximate a polynomial, an arbitrary polynomial with a different architecture. Um, now can this be done quite, well, it depends on, on the architecture you'd like to use, quite possibly. Um, um, we haven't really looked into that question very much, but I, I kind of imagine that it could be for, for certain architectures. Certainly someone already asked about changing the, uh, the activation function. I think that's probably doable. Um, how far, what other architectures you could try, I'm not sure. All right, any other questions? If not, thanks yep. again, Ben. I took a whole bunch oh, of sure. notes. I've been thinking about these things and I took a whole bunch of notes on a bunch of papers I didn't know about. So appreciate oh, uh, that. Thanks. I, I think there was one, there's someone with the, the hand up. Uh, uh, there's a hand up, sorry. Joshua. That's a quick question. So yeah, thanks for a very nice talk. So I was just wondering like, um, so it, since this is applied to MRI, so like, uh, um, is there like any, uh, practical connection, like with how 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 these are perturbation are causing the uh, different effect on, say, the fi final diagnostic in the re real medical application, and whether that will impact the uh, well, uh, the real more realistic situations. Uh, that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, so, um, uh. So I, I suppose there are sort of two parts to this question. Um, uh, so I, I should say, so, so the, the goal of our study was to, was to show instability. It wasn't to, to necessarily claim that uh, this would uh, fool uh, a radiologist. Um, uh, so we weren't trying to do that. Um, it was to show that these existed um, and to show that there's sort of, you couldn't take sort of stability for granted. Um, so uh, I, I think it's maybe premature to ask some of those questions because I don't think anyone's really decided what's the, what's the right way to use learning in the, in the context of say MRI. Uh, people are trying a lot of different things, but there are a lot of different approaches out there and it's not clear which one is in a sense gonna be the, the one that's favored um, by the, the manufacturers, uh, if, if any of them is. Um, I suppose a, a related question, uh, which maybe this is um, uh, closer to your to what you were asking is, I mean, can these perturbations be generated in in practice in a in a scanner? Um, so and, and it's it's true. So I mean, it's it, we're not claiming that these worst case perturbations will necessarily arise in a in an MRI scan. Um, but on the other hand, it's they, you, you can't, if you have, an, you have an unstable algorithm, you can't necessarily say that the perturbations can, can never arise. So I think that's, that's kind of the goal. So I think the, I, I, I um, we, we certainly had a, uh, some, some various exchanges with, with people and I, and I think what we're sort of saying is that uh, we're not claiming that these these worst case perturbations are are a reason not to use these algorithms. What we're saying is you can't take stability for I don't want to say for granted, but I, you have to think a lot more carefully about it than you did with sort of the previous generation of algorithms, which kind of had uh, they, they they were 
uh, either guaranteed to be stable by theory or or had better stability properties by construction. Here, it's a it's a much more subtle issue. I see. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks again, Ben. And why don't we um, take a ten minute break? And I see on the schedule, I think it's three twenty. We'll start back up with the breakout sessions. Cool. Uh, thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, Ben.